Well, so I am returning for one minute, not to spend too long before Jean-Pierre's talk, but still, uh, just a couple of words of introduction. I'm not sure he needs any, but, uh, well, it's a definite pleasure to have uh, Jean-Pierre Nogret here as a guest speaker. Uh, Jean-Pierre is an Emeritus Professor of English Literature at uh, Sorbonne Nouvelle uh, Paris 3 University and definitely a leading figure uh, of 19th century British studies here in France and beyond. Uh, he's a specialist of Arthur Conan Doyle, Robert Louis Stevenson, and also a very eminent translator. And he has been playing a major part in uh, translating particularly Stevenson's texts, but not only, to French readers and uh, will passing on the legacy. He has also published, well, uh, with an accelerated rhythm recently, but for quite a while now, some novels. Uh, five, if my count is... Oh, seven. Seven, okay, well, <laughs> I knew there was some room for hesitation. And also a collection of short stories. Um, well, just, um, so we're going to listen to him. And um, also, because at these conferences are also moments for, um, well, in my opinion, for personal, um, well, messages or uh, recognitions. Um, I, I worked with Jean-Pierre for, well, I've worked with him forever and he's always been a personal support. And uh, well, he was the one introducing me to the Stevensonians very early on in my career. And well, he certainly holds a very particular and pleasant uh, place in my, well, career and heart. So thank you very much for accepting to be here today. Uh, he will have an hour to um, present uh, this talk on Robert Louis Stevenson and the pleasure of nightmares. Okay, um, good morning everyone. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nathalie, uh, for your uh, introduction. Uh, um, it's, uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here already. So, um, and also thank you for, um, thank you, um, Leslie and Julie, for your um, uh, warm, I, I didn't say hot, but warm welcome. Okay, Stevenson, Robert Louis Stevenson and the pleasure of nightmares. This sounds uh, almost like an oxymoron, or at least a challenge. Um, now, my starting point uh, will be uh, quite simple. Um, um, that Robert Louis Stevenson as a child suffered from bad health and horrible nightmares is uh, amply supported and documented by the source materials provided by most of his biographers and above all by Stevenson himself. Uh, Jenny Calder describes his poems for children as, quote, full of the night, darkness, night thoughts and night specters, the thrill and the terror of being alone in the dark with one's own visions. In Stevenson's case, uh, indeed, going to bed was in, um, always a predicament, as his poem Northwest Passage from A Child's Garden of Verses testifies in part one, uh, stanza one. I quote, when the bright lamp is carried in, the sunless hours again begin, over all without, in field and lane, the haunted night returns again. And I've uh, managed to uh, retrieve this uh, illustration by an uh, American uh, artist, Bessie Collins Pease, sometimes also called Bessie Collins Pease Gutman, uh, dated 1905, who uh, managed to capture, I think, the um, sharp contrasts the uh, contested borderland between light and darkness, as the child wonders, must we to bed indeed, when facing, quote, the long black passage to the bed. And, uh, I think the, uh, you can see here on those two illustrations. Both uh, David Deitches and Claire Harmon quote from Stevenson's own notes of childhood, in which he describes his ill health, which chronicles itself by the long nights where he, quote, lay awake, troubled continuously by a hacking, exhausting cough, and praying for sleep 
or mourning from the bottom of my shaken little body. His nurse, Kami, would lift him out of bed, carry him to the window, and show him, quote, one or two lit windows up in Queen Street across the dark belt of garden. Other night scenes, he says, connected with my ill health were the little sallies of delirium that used to waken me out of a feverish sleep in such agony of terror as, thank God, I have never suffered since. It seems that Stevenson's father also played a part in soothing the child out of his terror and nightmares, as Stevenson explains in his memoirs of himself. Quote, I suffered at other times from the most hideous nightmares which would wake me screaming and in the extremest frenzy of terror. On such occasions, none could pacify my nerves but my good father, who would rise from his own bed and sit by mind, full of childish talk and reproducing aimless conversations with the guard or the driver of a mail coach until he had my mind disengaged from the causes of my panic. Stevenson provides a related description of his haunted childhood in a chapter on dreams, talking about himself in a third disguised person or persona as, quote, an ardent and uncomfortable dreamer. Uncomfortable dreamer as a child. Right from the beginning of the essay, which I guess is well known to, um, to us, he clearly connects a touch of fever at night and his struggles to ward off, quote, that slumber which was the beginning of sorrows. But his struggles were in vain, he says. Sooner or later the night hag would have him by the throat and pluck him, strangling and screaming from his sleep. If Kami, his second mother, his first wife, had a soothing role when the child would cough out of his feverish sleep, it seemed that she was partly responsible for his high-strung religious ecstasies and terrors, as Stevenson again recalls in his memoirs. It is to my nurse that I owe these last. My mother was shocked when, in days long after, she heard what I had suffered. I would not only lie awake to weep for Jesus, which I have done many a time, but I would fear to trust myself to slumber lest I was not accepted and should slip ere I awoke into eternal ruin. <coughs> I remember repeatedly, although this was later on and in the new house, waking from a dream of hell, clinging to the horizontal bar of the bed <coughs> with my knees and chin together, my soul shaken, my body converse with agony. It is not a pleasant subject, he adds. Now, Kami uh, is the one who, according to Deitches, read to him with great dramatic power from the Bible and Bunyan and accounts of persecuted covenanters. This impressed and pressed the sick child into dreaming of eternal damnation, the great white throne and hell which Margaret Stevenson apparently resented, although she seemed conspicuously absent from the scene or theatre of her son's nights, as the fetal image used by Stevenson with my knees and chin together twice suggests. A curious childhood then, a confusing world, as Harmon puts it, with Kami both comforting and worrying the child playing the part of the absent mother, but certainly not simply the angel of my infant life, as Stevenson says in his dedication of A Child's Garden of Verses. Couldn't she be the night hag plucking him, strangling and screaming from his sleep? A horrific inversion of the benevolent role she played when sick Louis would cough and cry in his unruly nights. This ambivalent role of the mother figure or substitute will be that of Fanny 
during that famous night of nightmares and geniuses at Bournemouth in 1885, as she would later explain. My husband's cries of horror caused me to rouse him, much to his indignation. I was dreaming a fine bogey tale, he said reproachfully, following with a rapid sketch of Jekyll and Hyde up to the transformation scene where I had awakened him. In other words, was she a protecting nurse, as Camille was supposed to be? Or again, perhaps, a night hag preying on his tumultuous but creative sleep? Of course, Stevenson was interrupted uh, in his bogey tale, much in the same way as uh, Coleridge was also interrupted um, uh, in his uh, dream of Kubla Khan. In the absence of the real mother, Thomas Stevenson seems to have played the part of the soothing storyteller, providing Louis or Lou with narrative material, as he would do later, according to the genesis of Treasure Island, listing the contents, for instance, of Billy Bones's chest. As Stevenson explains in his genetical essay, My First Book, the father had found in the plot of his son an echo of his own stories, dealing, quote, perpetually with ships, roadside inns, robbers, old sailors and commercial travelers before the era of steam, stories, quote, that every night of his life he put himself to sleep with, as if one could, instead of a teddy bear or a blankie, put oneself to sleep with a story. In their own way, uh, Cummy and Thomas then contributed in turning those nightmare nights into stories. Far from resenting Cummy's role in the shaping of his mind, Louis told her the last time she, uh, he saw her, it's you that gave me a passion for the drama, Cummy. To which she replied, me, Master Lou, I never put foot inside a playhouse in my life. I, woman, but it was the grand dramatic way he had of reciting the hymns. Camille turned out to be instrumental in fueling what Stevenson in A Chapter on Dreams later called these nocturnal dramas in the theater of the brain. The image of Thomas sitting by his son's side, full of childish talk and telling mink stories is also a means, I would argue, of shifting the pressure of bad dreams onto a more creative plane of making the link between haunted sleep and storytelling. A link which Stevenson would explore and explain in the same essay if instead of just having bad dreams or nightmares, the dreamer begins, quote, to read in his dreams tales. So I reached my first part uh, <laughs> entitled uh, I'm not, I hope I'm not Take too late. Phone. <laughs> uh, Take my phone to check the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, please don't. <laughs> uh, the pleasure of these abominable fancies. Dreams and nightmares are so important in the diegesis of his novels and stories that they sometimes precede actual encounters between characters and have a deep impact on their relationships. In the first chapter of Treasure Island, for instance, Jim is so impressed by Billy Bones's evocation of, quote, a seafaring man with one leg, that he becomes a sharer in his alarms, a secret sharer, perhaps, and dreams about the future long John Silver in the following way. How that personage haunted my dreams, I need scarcely tell you. On stormy nights, when the wind shook the four corners of the house, and the surf roared along the cove and up the cliffs, I would see him in a thousand forms, and now with a thousand diabolical expressions. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of a creature who had never had but the one leg 
and that in the middle of his body. To see him leap and run and pursue me over hedge and ditch was the worst of nightmares, and altogether I paid pretty dear for my monthly four penny piece in the shape of these abominable fancies. Now the decor here is obviously derived from Stevenson's childhood, as evidenced by the poem Windy Nights, which is set just after a pirate story in the child's garden of verses, and describes a man riding by at night, thus disturbing the child's sleep. Whenever the trees are crying aloud and ships are tossed at sea, by on the highway, low and loud, by at the gallop goes he. Perhaps a remini uh, reminiscence of Goethe's Er König, the reitet so spät, doch nacht und wind. We find in chapter 4 of The Merry Men a similar childhood association between the gale, the tempest howling without, the fear of the sea, quote, a constant haunting thought of the sea, and the potential stories of shipwreck and disaster. The kind of stories which an ancient sailor man mentioned by McKellar in The Master of Ballantrae would tell children in a lone house beyond the figured winds. I quote, Many feared or even hated the old brute of whom they made their hero, and I have seen them flee from him when he was tipsy, and stone him when he was drunk, and yet they came each Saturday. On the same page, McKellar describes young Alexander Dury being charmed by his uncle's, or is it his father's, stories of adventure, I mean James's uh, uh, stories of adventure, full of matter the most pleasing in the world to any youthful ear, pleasing in the world, hmm? such as battles, sea disasters, flights, the forests of the west, etc. Now, the question is, how can sea disasters be pleasing? Or to put it differently, why do we enjoy so much disaster films and sleep so very well after watching them? At least that is my case. In chapter 2 of the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, 1838, Poe's narrator says to his friend Augustus that his friend Augustus, quote, had a manner of relating his stories of the ocean, well adapted to have weight with one of my enthusiastic temperament and somewhat gloomy, although glowing, imagination. The same goes with dreams, if they feed on and result from, loop-like, a somewhat gloomy and glowing imagination. At the beginning of Richard III, Yes, there are three Richards, not just two. <laughs> mm. uh, Clarence, while in the Tower of London, says to Brackenbury that he has passed, quote, a miserable night, so full of fearful alarms, of ugly sights. He tells him he has dreamt he had broken from the Tower, was embarked to cross to Burgundy in the company of his brother Gloucester, who from his cabin tempted him to walk upon the hatches, so that when Gloucester stumbles, he tries to stay him, and in falling, his evil brother strikes him overboard. Clarence's description of the deep, as he fancies himself drowning, is quite famous. Just a few uh, lines to remind you of them. Methought I saw a thousand fearful racks, a thousand men that fishes gnawed upon wedges of gold, the great ingots, heaps of pearl, inestimable stones, unvalued jewels, and scattered in the bottom of the sea. Some lay in dead men's skulls, and in the holes where eyes did once inhabit, there were crept, as twere in scorn of eyes, reflecting gems that wooed the slimy bottom of the deep and mocked the dead bones that lay scattered by. This, uh, um, of course, is a frightful dream, as Clarence puts it. If uh, 
drowning Clarence use himself as soon to be joining the men that fishes gnaw upon. But I would argue that the nightmare also produces a wealth of imaginary material, a store of sea-related imagery. Given the fact that such keywords as dead bones, dead men, skulls, gold, are to be found here as well as in Jim's description of dead Israel hands being food for fish or silvers of men walking the plank to feed the fishes. One may argue, quite safely, that Clarence's nightmare has been <coughs> instrumental in feeding Stevenson's imagination in Treasure Island. Also, that he knew Richard III and this scene in particular. <coughs> this is, of course, evidenced by uh, Stevenson's rewriting of Richard III in um, The Black Arrow. We have a good instance here of romance making nightmares. In the Stevensonian sense of romance, which he defines as having some quality of the brute incident. Or these epoch making scenes which put the last mark of truth upon a story and fill up, at one blow, our capacity for sympathetic pleasure. We do adopt into the very bosom of our mind that neither time nor tide can efface or weaken the uh, impression. If we read, this is a, a quotation from a gossip on romance. If we read the account of Jim's initial nightmare as a text, it seems fairly obvious that the worst of nightmares, as he puts it, hinges on the variation between the phrase a seafaring man with one leg and but the one leg of his dream, that which protru protrudes in the middle of the body. I'm afraid one can't think of any other leg in the middle of the body than the phallus. So that James's nightmare can be read as a fantasy, as a Wunsch fantasy, as Freud would put it that of being pursued over hedge and ditch by a phallic creature whose leg undergoes the most terrifying but also fascinating plastic transformations. An image which will also be conveyed later on and confirmed by the tap-tapping of the blind man's stick upon the frozen road and by the name of Long, uh, the very name of Long John Silver's Inn at Bristol, the spyglass, another phallic image of a retractable telescopic object. In NCYS's impressive illustrations of the blind man and of, and of Long John Silver for Scribners in 1911, both Pew and uh, Long John Silver's uh, telescopic bodies, if I may say so, endorse and embody the fantasy of the one leg dreamt or and desired by Jim with all its variations in a thousand forms. And my question is, uh, how many legs does Long John Silver have? Uh, since you can see uh, not only uh, the, um, his uh, crutches, but also, oddly enough, uh, the very leg of, of Jim, which uh, seems to support and uh, maybe replace the, the missing leg. So we have, in a sense, a proliferation of legs, um, which seems to disqualify Long John Silver for uh, disabled studies. In, uh, um, and, uh, of course, this um, image, in a sense, um, is also um, uh, rewritten uh, and um, transformed, I insist, on the uh, uh, basic uh, transformational quality of those fantasies mm, or plastic mm, um, qualities. Um, on the island, the, uh, the first animal Jim sees during his shore adventure is a snake who raises his head from a ledge of rock and hisses at him with a noise, quote, with a noise not unlike the spinning of a top. Little did I suppose that he was a deadly enemy. 
And uh, this, uh, this remark, hmm, little did I suppose that he was a deadly enemy, I think, um, echoes uh, Jim C's own um, dismissal of Long John as a deadly enemy when he sees him for the first time, although he has made this terrific nightmare. So we have a strange contradiction here between the, the, the um, potential danger um, of, uh, of the man and the animal and the way uh, uh, Jim uh, dismisses or denies this uh, danger. Um, in uh, Johann Heinrich Füssli's famous pre-romantic painting, The Nightmare, mm -hmm. uh, dated uh, 1781, at least this version, since there are several versions of the painting, an apparent contradiction is to be found between the dire emergence of the mare's head with blind eyes on the left, hence uh, the, um, the reading of uh, the title as, as a pun, perhaps, the nightmare, okay? Uh, the ugly incubus sitting on the young woman's lap and the um, ecstatic posture of the recumbent woman who seems to be, after all, enjoying herself. The painting is remarkable because it provides both the um, subject, the uh, title, the nightmare itself, and the object, that is the dreaming woman within the same pictorial space. In other words, we have both the um, subject of the, um, of the painting and its title, but also we have the woman who uh, is supposed to see the, um, those two animals. And in a sense, we are placed in the same position as the woman. Hence, perhaps, our pleasure in um, looking at this um, uh, uh, painting. Um, the apparition, or as Stevenson would put it, visitation of the two beasts is the product of a fantasy on her part, so that the whole nightmare is about terror. But her posture suggests less horror than pleasure. And we may, I don't have uh, time to do so, but we may uh, also relate this uh, um, a painting with um, a Fragonard, uh, Fragonard's famous painting, um, uh, 1777, um, um, The Lock, or Le, Le Verrou, mm -hmm. in which we have a similar kind of uh, um, arabesque, mm -hmm. this time clearly pointing to uh, sexual desire, mm -hmm, or what I would call the um, arabesque of um, uh, desire. Other images of this posture, a uh, uh, strange uh, mixture of uh, fear and ecstasy in uh, Karl Theodor Dreyer's film Vampir der Traum des Alan Gray, that is the dream of Alan Gray, in which I think we uh, can also find uh, this uh, um, posture on the woman's part, and um, just uh, another kind of uh, um, uh, ambiguous ecstasy, if you like, in um, Robert Siodmak's uh, film uh, Criss Cross, at the end of which the two um, lovers who have committed uh, um, suicide um, uh, also uh, mirror this kind of um, ecstasy or lethal um, ecstasy. When uh, Jim uh, actually meets Long John Silver for the first time, he finds him a clean and pleasant tempered landlord and refuses to identify him with a man, um, that is, with the one leg of his dreams, in spite of overwhelming evidence, a clear denial or um, herneinung, as Freud would put it. The way the um, abominable fancies are translated into the real world, that is, into pleasurable contacts, suggests that nightmares, if abominable, also introduce, as stories this time, a space of seduction. Even if, and perhaps because, the male child is feminized into a submissive, fascinated creature. We have a similar um, apparent contradiction 
um, in The Master of Ballantrae with Alexander Dury playing the part, says McKella, of Dido to the master's diabolical Aeneas, that is, who becomes a kind of feminized uh, child, potentially seduced by um, uh, his uncle, or maybe his father, since some critics have argued that uh, Alexander is in fact James's child. Mm. Uh, or, on the next page, clearly compared to, I quote, the Eve in our perishable paradise, and the serpent hissing on the trail, another explicit phallic um, uh, image. Dreams and nightmare often precede and prompt adventures to come, as I said. In strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, it is because he is haunted, again a typical word derived from Stevenson's childhood, by two figures, that Mr. Utterson, the lawyer, lying and tossing in the gross darkness of the night, makes a nightmare about Mr. Hyde crushing a little girl at every street corner of the city, and then decides to haunt the door in the by street of shops. In other words, his bad dream precedes his real encounter with Mr. Hyde. And we may guess that to some extent, he enjoys this dream-related game of hide-and-seek. In other words, instead of just undergoing the nightmare, it is he who turns it into a pun. Child's play. A more creative process, which perhaps reminds of the spinning of a top image um, related to the snake on the island. Horrifying as the vision may be, it after all prompts, quote, in the lawyer's mind, a singularly strong, almost an inordinate curiosity to behold the features of the real Mr. Hyde. What uh, Freud uh, would call perhaps a Wissensdrang, that is a drive or prompting to know uh, or learn. By preceding real life, the nightmare shapes it gives it substance. As French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy has it in his book Tombe de Sommeil, it's difficult to translate this title, Tombe de Sommeil, because apparently it means falling asleep, but uh, in French we also have tombe, that is grave, and Nancy in his book plays on uh, both meanings of the word. I quote, Morphe transforme en forme la pure matière du somme which I will translate as Morpheus transforms into form the sheer stuff of slumber. It is because the nightmare is a form that it is able to transform the perception of reality. I quote, the dismal quarter of so seen under these changing glimpses with its muddy ways and slatternly passengers and its lamps which had never been extinguished or had been kindled afresh to combat this mournful reinvasion re of darkness seemed in the lawyer's eyes, <coughs> that is Mr. Utterson's, like a district of some city in a nightmare. The image of lamps versus this mournful reinvasion of darkness are obviously taken again from uh, Stevenson's childhood. They uh, <coughs> revive. Uh, the uh, one or two lit windows up in Queen Street across the dark belt of garden and confirm perhaps uh, G.K.'s Chesterton intuition that the real location of Jekyll and Hyde is not London but set in a deeper stratum, probably Edinburgh, viewed as, quote, some city in a nightmare. This vision of the city coheres with and confirms his previous dream of the wider labyrinths of the lamp-lighted city, this eerie, dreamlike quality of wanderings um, in the modern city viewed as a nightmare-related decor, um, is, I guess, uh, to be found in uh, Victor Fleming's uh, 1941 adaptation of Jiggle and Hyde. Um, and also um, in color this time, but uh, I, um, 
I hope you will see, I'm sure you will see the uh, connection, and also in the adaptation of uh, Schnitzler's uh, Traum Novelle by Stanley Kubrick in Eyes Wide Shut, mm, in which I think you find a similar effect mm, if you compare the two, uh, sorry, if you compare the two slides, mm, I think uh, you find a similar effect and a sharp contrast between light and darkness while the um, um, doctor mm, in, um, in uh, Kubrick uh, adapting Schnitzler is also uh, leading a double life, a respectable one in the day, a shady one at night. Uh, this sounds, of course, uh, like a remake of uh, Jekyll and Hyde. But it is probably because, as I have elsewhere demonstrated, that Schnitzler's story already is a remake of uh, Jekyll and Hyde. So that the film, Kubrick's film, is in fact the adaptation of an adaptation. In 1925, the same year when Schnitzler's story was published, Bertolt Brecht was already struck by what he called about the master of Ballantrae, Stevenson's filmische optique, that is Stevenson's um, uh, cinematographic um, vision, if you like, and no doubt that the scroll of lighted pictures image used to describe Utterson's nocturnal fantasies uh, already announces um, uh, cinema. In a sense, the doctor in both uh, Schnitzler and Kubrick has been trapped by the nightmare much in the same way as Mr. Utterson has been induced into hunting Mr. Hyde in the streets of the city. In both cases, the stories told by the dreams are so potent and all the more potent because they were presented as dreams. In the first part of The Body Snatcher, it is because the chance encounter between Fetis and McFarlane at the Old George Inn is compared to a dream that the narrator is able to tell his own version of the two men's past. I quote, the scene was over like a dream, but the dream had left proofs and traces of its passage. And this uh, reminds me of the um, um, Venetian mask left over uh, at the end of Eyes Wide Shut. Remember, this is the um, material proof mm, left mm, um, of the uh, by the passage of, of the dream sequence in um, the couple's uh, life. Okay, I move on now to a part entitled uh, Sleeping or Waking, Dozing Off and On. A long-standing tradition holds that sleep is a natural healer of the day's wounds and bruises so that one should welcome the comfort and shelter it provides. I see that Richard Ambrosini is already dozing, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe he will wake up soon. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Like the rest of you. <laughs> uh, the innocent sleep Sleep that knits up the ravel sleeve of scare, the death of each day's life, sore labor's bath, bath of hurt minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast, feast as Macbeth puts it, the innocent sleep, mm -hmm. after he has heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Another tradition holds that sleep gives free reign to fantasy or imagination, as Robert Burton explains in his Anatomy of Melancholy. In time of sleep, this faculty is free and many times conceives strange, stupend, absurd shapes as in sick men we commonly observe. In melancholy men, this faculty is most powerful and strong and often hurts, producing many monstrous and prodigious things, especially if it be stirred up by some terrible object presented to it from common sense or memory. In poets and painters, imagination forcibly works. A phrase, I think, which uh, um, recalls Stevenson's own description of his dreams, 
I quote, these were sometimes very strange. One that I remember seemed to indicate a considerable force of imagination. And I would, of course, underline this phrase, a considerable force of imagination. The, Stevens, uh, the Stevensonian psyche is, in fact, caught up in a kind of double bind. On the one hand, the natural wish to fall asleep after a long journey or day's work. On the other, the reluctance or fear of doing so. If nights are haunted, as the child in a child's garden of verses seems to fear. As Jean-Luc Nancy puts it, falling asleep implies literally the end of vigilance, n'être plus propre, n'être plus proprement dans le rapport de la propriété de soi, not to be one's own anymore, not to be in one's rapport of belonging to one's own. Between those two predicaments, the psyche often favors a kind of intermediary state, a gray or twilight zone, a space of in-betweenness where the fantasy alternates between the advantages of being still awake and the drawback of being asleep, so as to live in between and beyond the drawbacks of being awake and the advantages of being asleep, another type of denial. The result is often a blurring between the borders of being awake and being asleep, which could be defined as a kind of trance. To use and take up David Balfour's uh, own words in chapter 23 of Kidnapped, entitled Clooney's Cage, I quote, what with the brandy and the venison, a strange heaviness had come over me, and had scarce lain down upon the bed before I fell into a kind of trance, in which I continued almost the whole time of our stay in the cage. Sometimes I was broad awake and understood what passed. Sometimes I, I only heard voices or men snoring, like the voice of a silly river, and the clouds upon the wall dwindled down and swelled out again like firelight shadows on the roof. I must sometimes have spoken or cried out, for I remember I was now and then amazed at being answered. Yet I was conscious of no particular nightmare. Only a general, black, abiding horror, a horror of the place I was in and the bed, I lay in, and the plaids on the walls, and the voices, and the fire, and myself. Now note here the uh, same syntactic pattern as the one used by Jim in the description of his nightmare. Sometimes, 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 like Jim says, now, now, now. An instance of what psychoanalysts call the swinging beat or pendulum of fantasy, le battement du fantasme, which is never static but alternates, beats and swings from one image to the other, as evidenced by the plaids dwindling down and swelling out again, like the one leg of the seafaring man, a plastic fantasy and not surgery which mimics sexual potency and disability. What Stevenson, in his childhood uh, memory, called, uh, called disproportion. A good case in point, I think, is McCullough's various visions in The Master of Ballantrae, a turning point in his narration since it makes the transition between the Scottish and the American parts of the tale. And this is uh, something I hadn't noticed. I, ha I had to translate the Master of Ballantrae to uh, realize how important those visions were. At the end of the enemy in the house, after the decision has been taken by the Master to leave Scotland, a squall and a gale blow on the house of Darisdeer, like in the Merryman and many other Scottish tales. <coughs> 
And once in his chamber, McKenna says that owing to the pressure on his spirits, quote, the eldritch cries of the wind among the turret tops and the perpetual trepidation of the mason house, sleep fled my eyes utterly. He sits by his taper, looking on the black panes of the window, and the, upon that empty field, he says, I beheld a perspective of consequences that made the hair to rise upon my scalp. No less than the complete ruin of the family, all these I saw before me, painted brightly on the darkness. The striking image of the painting on the window panes is already to be found in the first part of the childhood poem Northwest Passage, stanza two. Now we behold the embers flee about the firelit hearth and see our faces painted as we pass, like pictures on the window glass. The effect to me is almost surreal, like in Magritte, Magritte's famous painting, The Key of the Fields, 1936, where the image of the landscape as seen through the window oddly sticks to the broken fragments of the painted window pane. Um, the metaphor of that empty field rings a bell if compared to the great field of lamps of an eternal city, which Mr. Utterson, also alone in his chamber, um, views um, in his mental repetition of Mr. Enfield's uh, tale. Another instance uh, is when Jim Hawkins in the apple barrel is on the point of falling asleep. When he hears the buccaneers and mutineers convening for their conference, what we are doing today, he lies there trembling and listening in the extreme fear and curiosity. It is because they both, they, that is, McKellar and Jim, both resist the temptation to sleep, to give up their vigilance, that they are able to grasp an ominous story which they would have missed had they actually fallen asleep. In other words, it is what Nancy calls la propriété de soi, which enables to save other people or guard them against impending disaster. In an essay entitled, and aptly entitled for uh, my uh, own uh, talk today on the enjoyment of unpleasant places, Stevenson describes a rugged, treeless Scottish coast where the winds are always blowing, quote, of the bitter, hard, persistent sort. Yet even such winds as these have their own merit in proper time and place, he writes. It is pleasant to see them brandish great masses of shadow and what a power they have over the color of the world. How they ruffle the solid woodlands in their passage and make them shudder and whiten like a single billow. In other words, it's, it is only because the wind has been blowing hard that one can taste, I quote, the more fully the pleasure of a sudden lull. And indeed, without the wind, the lull would be impossible and pleasure denied or refused. Without the turmoil of the gale, similarly, McKellar would have been unable to behold and grasp a perspective of consequences painted brightly on the darkness and having a power over the color of the world. In the next chapter, while describing their journey in the same miserable weather, the visionary perspective on the window panes changes into a real nightmare and a fantasy, as the syntax again suggests. Sometimes I would doze off in slumber, when I would find myself plunged at once in some foul and ominous nightmare, from the which I would awake, strangling. It's some, uh, the adjective strangling uh, seems strange to me because strangling, uh, he is strangling in the sense that he is uh, suffocating, but it might also suggest he is strangling someone. Mm -hmm. well, 
Sometimes, if the way was steep and the wheels turned slowly, I would overhear the voices from within, talking in that tropical tongue which was to me as inarticulate as the piping of the fowls. Sometimes, at a longer ascent, the master would set foot to ground and walk by my side, mostly without speech, and all the time, sleeping or waking, I beheld the same black perspective of approaching ruin, and the same pictures rose in my view, only they were now painted upon hillside mist. One picture in particular stood before him, I quote, with the true colors of a true illusion. It showed me my lord seated at a table in a small room, his head, which was at first buried in his hands, he slowly raised, and turned upon me a countenance from which hope had fled. I saw it first on the black window panes, my last night in Doris Deer. It haunted and returned upon me half the voyage through. This foul and ominous nightmare again sounds like a clear echo of childhood terrors in which Louis would also wake strangling and screaming. The fact that this dream should be related to the chase plodding in the rain, a motif also to be found at the end of the body snatcher, <coughs> recalls Thomas Stevenson reproducing aimless conversations with the guard or the driver of a mail coach to soothe his haunted boy. We may thus argue that the whole episode related by McCullough is in a sense the projection into the outside world of a night scene where dreams are associated with traveling in the rain. The phrase doze off in slumber can be read as a typical Stevensonian leitmotif as it echoes the second part of Mr. Utterson's nightmarish reverie. I quote, the figure in these two faces haunted the lawyer all night and if at any time he dozed over, it was but to see it glide more stealthily through sleeping houses. Dozing off or over is thus a dangerous state, what Nancy would call the end of vigilance, but it is also a means of seeing, the production of a scenario which the lawyer may act on. McKellar's intermittent swinging state of consciousness is significant in the sense that the sometimes syntax and beat tend to blur the usual distinctions between dreaming, dozing, slumbering and being awake and all the time sleeping or waking I beheld the same black perspective of approaching ruin. Compared to the first instance, where the perspective of consequences is simply painted brightly on the darkness of the window panes, it seems that the foul and ominous nightmare also participates in the fabric of the future. Its texture, to take up the opening image used by Stevenson in A Chaplain on Dreams. In other words, within three pages, McKellar's inability to sleep and his ability to find himself plunged into a nightmare contribute to the creation of a haunting image, that of my lord seated at a table in a small room, his head buried in his hands, which he slowly raises and turns upon him with a countenance from which hope had fled. The pictorial image used here by McKellar, is also significant. The child corrupted, the home broken up, my master dead, or worse than dead. Worse than dead? My mistress plunged in desolation. All these I saw before me painted brightly on the darkness. McKellar says in the first instance, the same pictures rose in my view with the colors of a true illusion in the second. This sounds indeed like an echo of Mr. Enfield's tale going by before Mr. Utterson's mind in a scroll of lighted pictures 
and consistent with Stevenson's essays, like the Lantern Bearers, where he states that no man lives in the external truth among salts and acids, but in the warm, phantasmagoric chamber of his brain with the painted windows and the storied walls. The phrase chamber of the brain is a key one here, as well as in a chapter on dreams, where the motif, uh, while the motif of painted windows explains why, probably in the first chapter of The Master of Bantre, Miss Allison flings that piece of gold which had just sent her lover to the walls clean through the family shield in the great painted window. An image, perhaps, which uh, announces McKellar's vision of family disaster. For her, for Miss Allison, the castle and house of Darius Deer are less real than part of the chamber of her brain, which may also explain why she is able to thrust the sword to the hilt into the frozen ground, a drive which she carries to the extremes of probability. The paradox of the nightmare, whether it be McKellar's or Utterson's, is then that it paints bright colors on the darkness, the pleasure of color and painting against a dark background or storied walls. This pleasure has to do with that of storytelling. What Stevenson, in a gossip on romance, drawing from Robinson Crusoe and the famous image of Robinson recoiling from the single footprint on the sand calls pictorial or picture-making romance. If pictures can be painted upon hillside mist, it is because Matt McKellar fancies himself as picture-making, using his dreams, like the narrator in a chapter on dreams, to weave the texture of tales. Stevenson's dreamers then seem to share the narrator's view in Edgar Allan Poe's The Pit and the Pendulum, when he feels and gropes about him in order to grasp the new state his body finds itself in, I quote, this is one of my favorite uh, Poe, um, Poe-esque quotations, I dreaded the first glance at objects around me, it was not that I feared to look upon things horrible, but that I grew aghast, lest there should be nothing to see. I now skip. <laughs> well, you skip quite a few. <laughs> to my conclusion. Um, resulting as they do from the uh, author's uh, dream work, Stevenson's novels and stories bear the imprint of his nightmares, which leave uh, traces of their passage in the text. Long John Silver's one leg in the middle of his body, the incident at the window, Hyde's corded, knuckly, hairy hand, the improbable, windless stricture of frost which has bound the air during the night of the duel between Henry and James Dury. McFarlane's fine gold spectacles found on the threshold of the inn the next day can be viewed as uh, remnants or what Stevenson would call a residuum in a chapter on uh, dreams um, of the dreamer that is the writer's activity and this is um, I think evidenced in um, Tullio Pericoli's illustrations of Stevenson uh, at work. We don't know exactly if he is uh, writing or uh, dozing or um, dreaming. And the very world in which these scenes were acted all brought down to this faint, same faint residuum as a, as a last night's dream. They contribute to what Marcel Schwab, in one of his essays on Stevenson, calls the unreal character of his realism. He argues, Schaub argues, that Stevenson's art consists in not saying. And of course, focusing just on Hyde's hand is more powerful than trying to describe the whole body. 
In that respect, a gossip on romance, 1882, and a chapter on dreams, 1887, are extremely well articulated and coherent. If picture-making romance relies on such impressive details, but as we have seen, Stevenson's fiction does not simply result from a dream activity. It also includes dreams in such a way that characters, en abîme, produce and at times reproduce their own nightmares, so that it can be viewed as a dream of dreams. To pick up Antonio Tabucchi's title, um, Sogni di Sogni which includes a dream made by young Robert Louis Stevenson, age uh, 15. It is a fiction, of course, in which Stevenson escapes from his chronic ill health on board a flying ship to the South Seas and into the heart of a cavern in the mountain. In a silver chest, he finds a book which he carries to the top. He finds his name on it, and it looks like Treasure Island, although the title is not fully written on the page. He is shown as reading it, waiting for the end. Stevenson's characters often slumber, doze off or over, have visions and nightmares which, far from being dispelled as untrue, or illusions are taken seriously. This is not only a mere question of belief in folklore or legends, nor even of Shakespearean influence, like Macbeth or Richard III, but I would argue a more philosophical stance, which French philosopher Clément Rosset would summarize by making a distinction between what he calls illusory perceptions and illusions of perceptions. In his book entitled L'Invisible, The Invisible, he argues that si dans l'illusion de perception l'objet de la vision n'existe pas, la vision de l'objet ou son imagination n'en existe pas moins. If in the illusion of perception the object of vision does not exist, the vision of the object or its imagination nonetheless um, exists. This distinction is shared by Henry James um, and his conception of the visible invisible in his ghost stories. For McKellar, whether awake or dozing off in slumber, sleeping or waking, we could coin the word, uh, perhaps we could coin the word um, sleep waking here, like in sleepwalking, the same black perspective of approaching ruin exists even if the object does not exist yet. Um, that is the vision exists, not the object, but the, uh, the vision of the object exists. This tends to embed and include characters as uh, writers, as collaborators of their own author, like in Stevenson's fable, The Persons of the Tale, where two puppets, like two actors between two takes, Long John Silver and Captain Smollett, have a talk in between chapters 22 and 23 of Treasure Island before the ink bottle opens and the author takes up his pen an inverted Jake Hillian uh, gesture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.